I was born in Rome, Italy. My mother is the um, eldest daughter of Dino De Laurentiis and my grandmother, Silvana Mangano. So I was born in Florida and I spent a few years of my childhood over there and then I moved back to Italy in Milan when I was around three years old. And I've been always going back and forth between the States and Italy through all my life. My name is Federica Raya. I was born in Naples and now I live in Venice, California. My name is Raffaella Camera. I was born and raised in Pesaro and now I live in Santa Monica. My grandmother was Miss Rome and she was a pinup girl and also an actress and mostly acted in my grandfather's movies. And they were a wonderful team together um, and they had a very glamorous life, I would say, the two of them. But they both came from nothing. Um, my grandmother's father was a train conductor and uh, my grandfather's parents were uh, pasta makers. And then when I was seven years old, the entire family moved. Obviously, we followed the patriarch, my grandfather, and everybody packed up and we all moved to the United States. And we landed in New York City, uh, where my grandfather had made a deal there um, to make movies. And then we all ended up in Los Angeles, which is pretty much where I grew up. So I started ice skating when I was eight years old in Milan. And it was really kind of, you know, love of the first sight. As soon as I saw the eyes and I asked my mom, can I train? And I really wanted to compete the day after. And so I started to uh, train with my coach, who was actually my coach for many, many years. And then I had the uh, pleasure to train with Carlo Fassi, who was the Olympic trainer training in Colorado more, but uh, also in um, Lake Arrowhead, where I trained for a couple of years, which is close to Los Angeles. So I used to come here to LA to train in ice skating when I was 14, 15. And uh, so I always had a very kind of bizarre, strange bond with this place because it's a kind of a, a love-hate love relationship I have with Los Angeles. Uh, without me really wanting to, to be here, life always dragged me into this place. I studied in Naples um, and then geology and uh, geophysics. And then I came to Santa Barbara to do a PhD at the Institute of, of uh, Coastal Studies at UC Santa Barbara. So I arrived here and it was people from Japan, from Korea, from Europe, from, uh, from Africa, all different peoples. They had a completely uh, different way of actually uh, thinking, doing, so it, it was an amazing experience. My parents uh, met in a very peculiar way. My mom was a beauty queen and she was chosen to be the Madonna of the uh, live nativity scene in Rivisondoli, which at the time was a big deal, I was told, and she started receiving letters from admirers. And I guess my father wrote better than the others, and so they met. My father was uh, very intelligent, but also equally difficult, uh, with a very narrow view of what women could or should be, and very strict. My mom, on the opposite side, was always very open-minded, modern in her thinking, very feminine and very curious about life. So I grew up a little bit with these different viewpoints and different ways of being. In the early years of my life, we really spent time as a family. My parents didn't really want us to assimilate. They wanted us to hold on to our culture, our tradition, speaking the language, cooking, ingredients, um, spending time eating together at night. We had rituals, you know, we ate breakfast together, uh, not lunch because we were in school, but my mother would pack my lunches. She wouldn't let me get a hot lunch. I didn't like it at all. But today, obviously, I wouldn't be able to do what I do without all of that. Holding on to culture and heritage and speaking the language and uh, learning to cook and learning our story. My grandfather really hammered it into us that you have to remember where you're from. You can't lose that because it's the thing that will define you later in life and will ground you. And I think that's probably very true. I. Definitely wouldn't have been able to come up with all these recipes and all the stories behind it had I not paid attention and if they hadn't pushed it so hard on us. I find LA a very challenging place. It's very spread out, but it has a rhythm and has kind of a vibe that is different from anywhere else in the world. And the day I stopped to search for Italy over here, 
the way I was doing it was I, I was always making comparison uh, between LA and Rome or you know LA and New York and always trying to find the same kind of lifestyle over here. And the day I stopped doing that, I actually discovered the beauty of this place that is totally different and has a totally different vibe and a different kind of approach to life. And a place for me that brought me a lot of sense of freedom and space and time to really, you know, uh, take care of myself and my dreams and what I want to accomplish in life. And in Italy, it was always kind of very packed with th things to do. And I was shooting all the time and working, which is amazing, but I didn't really have time to stop. And then last year, because of the pandemic, obviously, and also Los Angeles, I had this chance to really kind of took a moment for myself. And so I can talk for hours, but anyway, my, my bond with LA, it's very strange. <laughs> I started as a volcanologist and I was very excited because, you know, being from Naples, I grew up with the city, with the Vesuvius, and my, you know, my passion was to study the Vesuvius. And I did so for many years. And then I was in New York. And when I was in New York at the American Museum of Natural History, doing postdoc there, I developed other interests in communication and education. I met there some colleagues. So we worked together and always together to design courses, to design a program. So this exposed me to all this other world in education, in communication, and I got very interested in that. And slowly, slowly, I realized that I was developing a strong interest in, in the research in that field. And so I, I was looking at how people were teaching and understanding what science was, and I realized there was a, a disaster. <laughs> And then I wanted to participate in changing that with other colleagues. And so when I was uh, at CUNY, uh, I changed slowly in another field, which is education. I also wanted to do everything that my brothers did. I idolized them and I wanted to be exactly like them. So I was a little bit of a tomboy, but they were swimming, for example, when they were little. So when I was two, I started swimming and I competed until I was six. Uh, and I won the national championships uh, when I was three and a half in the category for kids under six. I then started playing the piano when I was four. Again, my brothers were playing the clarinet and I wanted to do what they did. So I asked my parents if I could play an instrument and I chose the piano. My mom was an elementary school teacher and she had already taught me how to read and write at home and I was getting bored. Uh, she tried to send me to kindergarten or preschool and I raised hell. I didn't want to stay, um, so she was teaching at a private school, so she was able to take me to class every day. So I did basically a first grade with her. Then the last week they put me in a regular first grade class, and from there I continued. So when I was 12 years old, my grandfather opened a DDL food show, one in New York and one in Los Angeles in Beverly Hills. And he imported Italian products, similar to what we know as an Italy today. And then he had a restaurant on the top floor, a small restaurant. He also had a pizza yolo making fresh pizza. He had a pasta maker making fresh lasagna sheets. You could buy ravioli, stuffed ravioli with the sauces and then make it at home. He had all of that. He had a butcher, he had uh, a fishmonger. He had all of those uh, things there within this space. But I think the thing that I loved the most was that he brought all of his pizzaiolo friends that he grew up with in Naples and all his pasta maker friends. Imagine the excitement and the curiosity when people came in and then the oohs and ahs and then the aromas. To me, the aromas in, in the space were the most amazing. And then the chatter, everybody talking and being lively and being friendly. And it was just an unbelievable environment for me. And for my grandfather, he seemed like a kid in a candy shop. You know, I wasn't really looking to become an actress at all. And I started to do some ads for TV and I didn't really like it. I, my parents were both working in, in the fashion industry and I couldn't care less. I, they looked at me once in this model agency in Milan and they took measure of my hip and my waist and they say, oh, this girl doesn't exist because I'm very tiny. And I said, how dare you? I don't exist. This is like nonsense. I don't, I don't want to do this. It was so clear to me that I was not interested at all 
in being a model or doing anything that has to do with fashion directly. So then I started to audition and then I end up having this agent in Rome and he called me. I was actually on the bus and it was raining, it was pouring rain in Rome. I had this long stripy dress made of wool. So with the rain, it was very heavy and very long and I dragged this dress all around the place and I hop into the bus and then I arrived in Via Romagnosi, very far away where the Rise studio were at the time. And then my agent at that time called me and said, you know, uh, you need to come back because Lina Vermuller wants to meet with you. I was like, what? Really? It's like, yeah, yeah, you have to go back. Like, she wants to see you now. So anyway, I took my bus back with my heavy dress full of rain, blah, 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 and I arrived to Lena's home. Now I'm uh, uh, concentrating on studying how in the practices of teaching or medical interactions, where there's also teaching in practice, people respond to each other, you know, normally as they always do. So I do that to work with practitioners, teachers or doctors to modify these practices to make them better. When you see yourself in video, <laughs> acting and talking to other people, you, you can study yourself and understand certain things that you would like to change. When you work with practitioners like me, uh, researchers, they can actually show you other things. They're there, they're positive or they're, you know, they need to be changed. It, it becomes a dialogue in which you can both grow. And so what I do, I videotape patients, doctors interactions, where there's also the training of younger professionals. And in this, you see the communications, especially when you need to understand how to treat a person as a person and not as a, a body. So I am particularly interested in, uh, in uh, working in, in cases and in, uh, in uh, high, uh, high tech uh, practices, for example, so transplantations where people have machines, they had to pump their heart or artificial heart. As far as my father is concerned, his thought was that women really are supposed to be mothers or maybe teachers, but not much more than that. So I think that naturally without knowing what I was doing, I was looking for ways to have freedom and to grow and to, you know, shape who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. So I think that led me to come to the States when I was 15 for the first time. Unfortunately, although my grandfather, uh, Dino, was very successful in the movie business and did over 600 movies in 60 years, he wasn't as successful in the food side of it. And after a couple years, Beverly Hills closed. And I think that sometimes in life, timing is everything. So for him, the movie business was the perfect time. He hit it and he became wildly successful with Oscars and Golden Globes and made some really phenomenal movies that we have stars today. We still know Jessica Lange, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I mean, he started most of their careers and he had a real eye for talent. David Lynch, like all of these people that we now study from today. It was a pretty incredible person to have in your family. It's also very difficult <laughs> because, I don't know, can you aspire to be as, as loved and as wildly successful as that? It's a hard act to follow. She had this amazing house in, uh, near Piazza del Popolo um, that really became my second home in Rome for years. I met her with her white glasses and you know, Lina is an icon, so we all know her. And so we started to talk and, and it was very nice. Well, I felt very comfortable with her. And then she said to me, do you speak German? I was like, yeah, I do, because I started German at school. Okay, so then she gave me the script and she says, do these two scenes with a Neapolitan German accent, if that can make any sense. I was like, oh, okay. And so we read the scenes and I've tried my best. And uh, after that, she said, in soma, which is a Roman accent to say in soma. Sometimes the Roman use the Z instead of the, so I was like, oh, okay, well, and, so, and then I left. So then I got cast to do a theater after like, you know, a few weeks and I was on the stage doing this play. And then my agent came, say, he cast you. She wants you to do the movie. So I couldn't believe it. I have goosebumps now because Lena obviously passed away a few weeks ago and um, has been a massive loss for me in the sense that has been the root uh, to this business for me and really the way I started this career. So anyway, I've done her first movie and uh, it's been a kind of a challenge because Lena was Lena, so Lena was wild and you know, if uh, you had to like to go to the loo, she was like, I can't wait for you, the sun is not gonna wait for you and she has a little whip and she was like, Pfft. And I loved her so much. I always felt like a lot of people were scared of Lena, but she made me laugh a lot. Like when she was really angry, she was tiny with this huge charisma and getting really kind of feisty. And I thought it was very funny. She's, she was really unique.
we wrote a book on one person who was pretty young in in his thirty. Uh, so from one day to another, he was in the hospital and uh, couldn't get out of the hospital, and he was told that he needed a heart transplant. But to get a heart transplant, you had to wait. They had to put a machine inside his uh, uh, body that pumped his heart. And this machine has a tube that comes out of the belly and then connects to batteries and a computer. So you walk around with this computer so your body is inside, outside, there's a connection with the outside that you don't have before on your body. At the time, they were very noisy, so you hear click-clack, click-clack, click-clack all the time. See, when you have your heart pumping, you, you don't hear it. It's just part of who you are. So now it's outside and you hear it all the time, but it's a machine sound. You don't think about how you walk. You don't think about how you sit. When you take a shower, you're thinking about your beautiful life, what you're going to do today. That's not it. And so it changes your life completely. When you go through an experience like that, it's so powerful, so dramatic. It, it, it really changes your entire understanding of who you are because all of a sudden you see your life as before transplant and after transplant. So this moment becomes a break in, in uh, your life and also becomes very difficult to relate yourself to what you were before. And so how you reconcile this and keep going as yourself. In this case, his daughters are particularly powerful in how they help their patients to actually reconcile the sense of self throughout their life. So their relation with the patients is not just taking care of the heart, but is to uh, taking care of the person. And that I found it really powerful and we have a lot to learn from that. So I decided to concentrate on that because this is exactly what we should do in any case everywhere. Uh, how you help a person that needs to find her own or his own or their own way of living, it's very difficult. And so that's what I'm studying. I was an exchange student, and I think that the year not only taught me how to live in the States, how to be in the States, and certainly helped me later on when I came back, but it also made me grow up quite a bit. I became more independent, faster, and when I came back to Italy, my parents had separated. So for me, that year was almost like changing completely from one book to another, and not even from one page to another. At first, both my parents uh, seemed very supportive of it. But then right at the end, when I was ready to send the documents to Rome uh, so that it could find me a family, my father changed his mind and he decided that I could not go. Um, and that was probably one of the most difficult parts of one of the most difficult things that happened really probably in my family because it, it, it kind of like made it explode. Um, very different personalities in the house, but at this point, the only way for me to come was to really have almost somebody else decide. Uh, so in, in the middle of all that, my parents separated, and at the end of the day, a judge ended up um, signing for my father, allowing me to come. My mother for me was um, uh, everything pretty much. Because my father was so difficult, she was really kind of like my escape. She always let me do whatever I wanted. She had to deal with a lot. She had three kids, she was going to the university, she was studying, and she did not have a supportive husband at home, uh, a rather difficult husband. Yet she managed to do it all. Uh, she took care of us and she let us live our life the way that we wanted. She let us leave when we wanted to leave. Um, so I, I owe everything to her. My mother has been always a great supporter of any of these adventures of mine. How difficult must have been in the, in the south of Italy? You know, she was a single mother and uh, to say to her only child, just go, go to your adventures. And uh, I'm eternally grateful for that. It's not easy to do, really. So I loved food, even from a very young child. I would spend time in the kitchen with my grandfather making pizza dough, and I have such fond memories of that. So I went to college, and then after college, I decided I wanted to go to culinary school. I loved desserts, so I decided to go to Paris. 
and try to become a pastry chef because who makes better pastries in the world than the Parisians? So I went and I came back and I started working in restaurant kitchens. It was tough. The restaurant kitchens was difficult. It taught me a lot. Those restaurant kitchens taught me a lot about um, multitasking for sure, but being tough and really understanding how to navigate in a man's world because the kitchens are definitely a man's world. They're getting better now, but 20 some years ago, 25 years ago, not a chance. There weren't many women. And those of us who were there were usually in the pastry department. Anybody working the line or the savory side were all men. In the last few years, obviously, I've been working for 23 years now. So, and I have a very happy career and I'm uh, very grateful really for, for what I achieved, but uh, I started to feel kind of stuck. I'm very passionate as a person and also with ice skating and with everything I do, I always had a very strong kind of, you know, bond with the thing I'm doing and I'm totally immersed and I'm totally devoted and I'm, that's the way I approach life in general and my career. And at one moment I started to feel less engaged. It started a few years ago when I really had this need to go back on stage because I was doing a lot of TV. And in Italy, unfortunately, they had for years. I think now it's shifting slightly, I hope. But they really had like this prejudice that if you do a lot of television, you can't do cinema for some reason. This whole thing did not make sense to me at all. And I just wanted to be a performer. I wanted to act. I want to be, you know, connected to what I'm doing and to what I'm reading and what I want to to deliver. I wanted to do a play and I wanted to do a play that really would have speak to me. So I started to search. And so I saw after Miss Julie in London, because actually my husband was playing the male lead in this play written by Patrick Marber. So I bought the rights from Patrick and I actually brought on stage this play that I really kind of built from scratch. Like a, they, it's never been done before in Italy. So that was my first time when I actually said, oh, I actually can do things instead of just being kind of waiting to audition and I can build what I want to do. And I will actually brought on stage a female lead. When I was in New York, I met Mario, my husband, uh, Mario Deng. He's a German Chinese and with an Italian name, which is fantastic. <laughs> and we fall in love immediately. So we were there together for seven years. We decided that we will never leave New York that uh, we bought a house in the countryside which we, where we got married. And then we decided to come to Los Angeles <laughs> so right after. And so Mario was asked to, to come to LA to uh, build a program for, for uh, heart transplantations and mechanical assist device. And we came to UCLA and I had to start from scratch. So assistant professor again, and I had to redo tenure and all this. As a woman, you start thinking about it. What does it mean to support your partner? Our generation is more prone to do that. Women do this more for their husband, but it costs a lot. I did it with joy, with, uh, with a lot of, and Mario support me a lot. So, but it was a, a, a difficult move. I had to restart from really from scratch. And, uh, but it was exciting. Very exciting. I thought I wanted to really try to just do music. So I applied for a number of scholarships for um, at universities in the United States for a master's in piano. I received a few different scholarships and I chose the one from USC, University of Southern California. They were very nice because they paid uh, for my schooling completely. The only problem was that they weren't paying for anything else. So I came with $2,000 and, uh, and nothing else. Uh, so it took me a little while to get on my feet. For the first four months, I didn't have a place to stay because I couldn't afford the rent. So I slept on couches of different people, sometimes moving once a week. And then in December, I remember December 4th, I slept in a bed for the first time. I was able to rent a place with a friend of mine, a guitarist. And then from there I went. LA looks particularly friendly from the outside, but it's actually a very lonely place if you don't have kind of like your life set up. Uh, one of my brothers, Gabriele, uh, convinced me to just apply for a different type of scholarship, for a lecturership. With a lecturership, you work for the university and you get tuition paid at the same time. So you're a lecturer, so you teach, and a, in exchange, they give you a stipend and they also pay for your studies. So I applied for two of them and I got both of them. One was to teach piano and one was to teach Italian. 
but Italian was double work and double money, so I took that one and I started teaching Italian. I applied for business school. Uh, they accepted me the day before classes started, and so I did my MBA at USC, and that changed a little bit the, the course of, of things in that sense. It's going to sound odd, but 9-11 happened. My grandfather was also getting a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Oscars, and there was a lot of press around that. When I say 9-11, because in 9-11, America woke up and realized we want to eat at home and we want to pay attention to our families in a way that we never did before. And people didn't cook as much at home. They didn't spend time grounded at home around the table the way Italians did. So I was approached by a friend of mine who worked for Food and Wine magazine and they said, we're doing a family issue and we'd love for you to get your family together and do a De Laurentiis brunch. So I did it at my grandfather's house with my family and I did all the recipes and man, did I love it. From there, I got a call from Food Network that saw the spread and asked if I would put myself on camera and if I could make an easy dish. Having come from a family like I came from, my brother knew some editors and we did a quick little video and put a little music to it, whatever, and I sent it in. And Everyday Italian, my first television show, was born. And at the beginning, it was not that well received. You know, I looked to my Aunt Raffi, really, who I, I really looked to her for guidance of things that were okay and weren't okay. I was really scared. But I do remember my grandfather being very worried. The shift that I had, I started to think, okay, now I'm 40 years old and I've done a lot. And what do you really want to do as an adult? And where, where do you want to go? And I didn't know really where to start it. And then I started to developing my own ideas as I can actually look at this and get the rights and develop this story or I can start writing with a writer I know you know I've been working for so many years so I know a lot of people amazing people and talented who actually want to have new kind of tasks or work that are really connected to something. I started to work on different projects now I'm, I'm working at six different projects that some of them are already into production, kind of advanced state of production, and I just finished to complete my the subject of my first movie. But as Lena said, you know, the secret is taking actions. Don't be up here, or, you know. And so I just sat and I was like, okay, I need to get out of this, of the mind, and started to be creative. I see the younger generations, they do completely different things. They completely, you know, the husband uh, support the wife, the wife support the husband, independently of the gender. You know, so that I I found it very beautiful. Would Mario have uh, supported me? I don't know because the situation never presented itself. But Mario has been always very supportive of, of my work and career, and I have to say he, uh, he is my agent. He is fantastic when he talks about my work. <laughs> I could win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> so. Um, I'm lucky to be, you know, to, uh, to have met him. Also, uh, this started a collaboration on the professional side. I have to say, though, that uh, we tend to, what they say here, talk shop all the time. So when husband and wife work together, there is a possibility of talking work all the time. So we had to set some rules. That's it. Glass of wine. Let's talk about something else in the evening. <laughs> so, but uh, it's been an amazing journey, really. So at the end of business school, I had to decide what kind of career I wanted to have. What I did know is that I wanted to have a career that allowed me to still be creative, that led me to innovation. In about 2010, I started dipping my toes in AR and VR, augmented reality and virtual reality. It was at the very, very beginning of things, so that led me to being uh, called by Accenture to help them start and grow the uh, XR practice, XR, AR, VR. Next, that experience uh, led me to join Epic Games. So I went even more into innovation, into what is the future, gaming, the metaverse. I am currently uh, head of brands and advertiser solutions for Epic Games, Unreal Engine. So it's my job to form strategic relationships with biggest global companies in fashion, in retail, apparel, beauty, and really work together to create their presence in the metaverse. If you were in the movie business, TV was way below you. It's not like today where the TV business is actually much bigger almost than the movie business is. The cachet was below what he felt our family and our family name should be part of. He told me to be careful and to not destroy what he had built for our family. 
And I have to tell you that those words resonated and I was very nervous and skittish to make any decisions. And then in the end, I think was so incredibly proud, but it, it, we had to go through many ups and downs to get there. It was difficult. I took a lot of heat from a lot of different people, including people in the, in the chef world who were like, who is this girl? What is this? They wanted women who weren't wearing the intimidating outfit of a male chef look. And I think that was in order to really gain viewership, female viewership. But I think in life, you just gotta keep going. You gotta do whatever you deep in your heart you know you can do. And for me, I think a lot of people say, you know, well, you got there because of your family name, but honestly, nobody in that world knew my family. So it, I think it was fun to be able to build something on my own. And my name didn't make it any easier, by the way. Nobody could pronounce my name. Not even to this day can they pronounce my name. I went through so many ups and downs, but overall, I think now at 50, I will tell you that looking back, they were all things that in the end gave me the strength to get to where I am today. Coming from the south of Italy, I thought that here in, in the United States, women in science will be equally appreciated as men in science. And it was not true, absolutely. I found a lot of times that uh, uh, colleagues were talking down to me. I was also a foreigner, so I have an accent. I was corrected my pronunciations in front of my students. I was uh, told to shut up in meetings. Of course, I fought back immediately because as a good Neapolitan woman, <laughs> I fought back on this. It was there and it was always there. It was not rare. That's what uh, shocked me. I saw the difference with that other colleagues. They were losing their sense of being a woman, and I didn't want to do that. And so you had to work much harder to be recognized. You cannot make a mistake because if, if a man does a mistake, okay. If you do a mistake, oh, you're not good, you're not good enough. I had to modulate my, my way of talking more gentle, without strong emotions in my tone. A man talking like me was firm. And this is everywhere. Here too, in California, everywhere is like that. It continues to be like that. So the metaverse is this uh, nebulous thing that everybody's talking about and no one has a definition for it. What we know is that we're moving into a new digital era where we are not going to be looking at the flat screen anymore, but we're gonna have in the future something in front of our eyes and we will be able to interact with information, with our friends, with products, uh, with entertainment, um, almost as if we were touching that because the information will be shown in 3D, in a 3D fashion. It can really help us come together more, particularly during the pandemic, gaming took off. And that's not just because people are playing games, but because they meet in a game. They're able to talk to each other and they're able to communicate. So that idea of social entertainment almost and this natural way of interacting with somebody else when you cannot be in person can really uh, bring people together more. There is also a way of representing yourself with avatars or with digital humans and, and really kind of like almost be who you want to be and bring yourself in this new world, depending on how you feel that specific day, depending on what your sexuality might or might not be. But this idea of digital self-expression, owning your persona and bringing it along with you in whichever virtual world you might be, is certainly a beautiful one uh, that can be explored. I think that the biggest achievement is probably opening Jada in Las Vegas on the Strip. It was the scariest. It was the, the biggest risk I think I have ever taken. There weren't many people who had faith that it could be successful. And also at the time when I opened it, there weren't, except for maybe one other celebrity female chef, there weren't any on the strip. They were all men. I think that, you know, they feel that women don't have the um, drive. They don't have the stamina. And so that, that took a lot out of me. I mean, I ended up, getting divorced. Uh, I had a young child at the time. Uh, it, it was it was traumatizing. It was very difficult, um, but we got through it. And seven years later, it's still one of the most successful restaurants. And I did it the way that I wanted to do it. I fought tooth and nail, but I did it. And I think for me, that's probably one of the biggest achievements and probably the hardest thing so far that I've had to endure. 
I always say it's like I discovered a new color in life. I love painting. And when you have a, a baby, when you become a mom, there's a new color that has been created on your palette that you didn't, you didn't know existed before. It didn't actually exist for you. And so motherhood brought me, you know, completely different perspective on things, especially for people who does our job, who's so ego-centered and ego-driven sometimes, which is actually the path and the route to unhappiness. I really believe that. So actually motherhood has been the most amazing experience for me. It's unthinkable before, I think, if you're not a mom. It completely shifts the world completely into another perspective, which I, think's, I think on the creative way, it's actually really important because it allows you to experience things differently with a different kind of intensity. One of the difficulties of moving to Los Angeles when we came to UCLA was that I arrived as a, a spouse hired. I was considered the wife of, and that was for me one of the most difficult moments in, in my life because I came to, to this country alone. I didn't come with Mario, I came alone and I made it by myself. It created for me uh, a space where I couldn't recognize myself, also because I changed careers. So I didn't have any anything to hold for me and tell me, you are this. It was hard. Um, so hard that sometimes people were insinuating that uh, my work was done by Mario, that I had to demonstrate that uh, the book was written by me and not by Mario, and the research was done by me and not by Mario. And so I said, fine, I can do that, but do you mean that uh, I can take care of patients with heart transplantation? Because if we are exchangeable like this, he can do my work, I can do his work. And that was it. <laughs> but you had to really push back for, for these things. Over the past few years, particularly here and particularly, I would say, in LA and in this environment, women definitely have started sticking together. We even meet once a week with one of them. It's called Women in XR. And I don't think there is really necessarily competition. Yes, there might be competition if you get to the same position and you want the same exact thing. But otherwise, I actually found there is an understanding of we need to push each other if we really all want to rise up. It's a very different environment and it feels really good to spend time with them. You'll hear a lot of people tell you, oh, what do you think you're doing? You can't do that. I heard that a lot uh, when I was applying to come to the States. Um, I remember one of my teachers calling me to the side and saying, Camera, what do you think you're doing? Come on, just don't pay attention. Keep on going and, you know, keep your sense of adventure and curiosity. Don't give that up. And it doesn't matter where you're coming from. You don't have to come from a big city. You don't have to come from a perfect situation. In fact, I find that sometimes if you don't come from a perfect situation, if you have something that you don't like, it's easier to try to find a different solution and go outside of, of the regular way that you would do things. My daughter's 13 and 13 years ago, I was scared out of my mind to have a child. And I thought, oh my God, my life is over. How, how am I gonna work as much as I work and also have a child? It was, it was hard. It was very difficult at the beginning. And I used to cart her around everywhere. But I also think that she changed my career. There was a pivot point when I had Jade where all of a sudden, women accepted me in a different way. It was like I was one of them all of a sudden. I wanted to be an inspiration for my daughter. I wanted her to know that you can be successful in whatever you're doing and have a family. Are there some costs? Definitely. There will always be some costs, but you can do both things. You can be passionate in your work life and be fulfilled and also passionate in your home life. The more traditional sense is that women stay home, but I think it's starting to change. And I think we're open to helping each other. And I think that young girls need inspiration. And I think you have to be able to lean on people in order to have success of both. And I really wanted her to see that. In the end of the day, not knowing that was the goal. The goal is to inspire my daughter from female to female. I certainly didn't do it alone. And my family's a big part of it. And you know, I had some special ladies in the beginning who, who came into my life and really helped me with Jade and, and made it possible for me to do a lot of things. And I think for women, we just have to be okay asking for help. You need this, a really great support system. And women are some wonderful support systems to each other. And as we get older, I find that it's even more like that.
I've never been, even in the most successful times or when I was in my 20s, I've never been one of those who are like, ah, oh, life is amazing, it's so easy. I always found life a challenge and not always, and scary in a way. So I think the biggest lessons for me has been to really let go of the perfectionism and to really, you know, take time and try to live in the present moment. It's more about what I want to share and create and and this has been a gift, I think, of the pandemic as well. I think a lot of us found in this crazy time some kind of silence to really kind of reassess the priorities in your life and work on ourselves. And we never had a chance before because we're always so moving so fast. The Lumiere Awards are uh, given every year uh, by the AIS, the Advanced Imaging Society. It's really the application of technology and 3D technology to anything that is entertainment. So movies, but also then branding. Two years ago, I was proud and humbled, uh, greatly humbled to win one of them. I won an award for a VR project that I did with partners. I went to pick it up uh, on the stage at Warner Brothers. It felt really good. I really wanted to harness uh, my fans and have a more of a dialogue, sort of like you do on social. And I wanted to consolidate all my recipes and have them in one place. So I started that about six years ago and the platform name is Jodzi. And it's Jodzi because that was my nickname in my 20s. And now it's I've, I've added on to that by adding an e-commerce arm to it. And um, we import curated Italian products from all over Italy. And I tell a lot of stories behind it. And I also write recipes to go along with the um, products so that you know what to do with them. I'm basically starting a marketplace for all goods Italian. And then eventually I'd like to start it for all different ethnic brands and be the sort of the place that people shop for anything outside of a traditional American ingredient. I miss of Italy the human relationship between people. I find here sometimes very corporate, very cold, but led by the rules and the rules are important, but sometimes you need to be kind of flexible or human. Like I had few happening here that really upset me. And so in Italy, I kind of like, it's a bit more loose in a way. And you have a relationship with the butcher. You know, I can leave the keys down to my pharmacy because the guy is a friend of mine. He is unheard of. I've been going to Rite Aid for three years. They barely know me. Like, and I say, hi. And it sometimes is like so big. And I find that I miss this human connection and I miss the culture. I miss seeing a beautiful building. I miss Piazza Santa Maria in Trastevere. I miss, you know, I miss that a lot. I just got back from Italy. I was there. I started laughing. There is a way of enjoying life, of being present in everything, the food, the laughter, the discussions about life, about politics. I just felt alive. There is a, a joy of being with others. There is a unimediatezza, is a, an immediate way of relating to another person and the embraces. I miss this a lot. It's a, a, a philosophy of, uh, of life. It's a way of understanding what it means to be with others alive. That I miss a lot. And the food is great, but that I miss a lot. From Italy, I miss certainly the people, my friends, my family. I miss the architecture. I really miss seeing the, the red roofs and the beautiful streets and the old architecture and the new architecture, the food and in general, the, the culture, the way of being and solving situations in a more organic way without, uh, without being so organized. It works great uh, when it's in a work environment, but I think for life in general, having a little bit more of a, let's take it as it goes, um, does make you feel better and it makes you feel closer to others. My next dream is to build this platform into a, a very successful marketplace. And that is what I'm presently doing at the moment in a way to sort of own my own brand and start a new one. What I'm going from here is um, I'm now in the process of uh, combining my, my dream, which is uh, studying practices, but also entering the spaces of the communities. I'm interested in connecting school communities, especially in areas that are not affluent, with the medical practitioners and all this uh, uh, richness of UCLA. So my next uh, big dream is to do a project that acts 
on the territory, in the communities, not at the university, not inside an hospital, but in the communities and working together to support people that are bright, that are joyful, they don't have resources to share with us. And so that's my dream. My next dream from an overall humanity perspective, I would love, um, you know, I went to see Bjork last night. And she had a, she had a phrase uh, in her show that said, I hope for technology and nature to collaborate and come together. And I very much hope for that as well. I think that there is so much that technology can do, but sometimes it's not being utilized for the correct reasons. So my next dream for the first time, I have to say, is staying the way I am at the moment. It's kind of finding this balance that I found and uh, being happy with what I have. The tricky part, and we really think sometimes we are here just to be happy in this lifetime, but I actually think it's just a journey. And when you actually accept that, it's fun. So I'm having a lot of fun at the moment. I'm having, my dream is to stay where I am, to keep this awareness and I hope it's gonna last. I, I hope it's not gonna fade away, because it might, I don't know. <laughs>